Hello and welcome to the webinar, Agriculture, Food Production and Health. Um, we're just getting um, started and we're going to start in a few seconds here. We're just waiting for a few more attendees to join. Okay, well, hello, and welcome to the Green Bag Lunch and Green Tea webinar series on the health implications of food and agriculture. My name is Megan Edelman, and I will be your host for the webinar series. Um, I'm an Annie member and a nurse. I worked for many years um, as a PACU pre-op nurse in the Santa Rosa area, but now I'm more focused on health education and population health advocacy work. Uh, we do have a few housekeeping things to take care of before we begin. This webinar platform form works best using Chrome. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, the first thing would be to close out your um, browser, restart. Um, this webinar series will have seven parts to it. If you enjoy today's webinar series and find it useful, please invite your colleagues to our upcoming webinars, which will mostly fall on the first Monday of every month with the exception of some holidays. If you have any questions for presenters, um, you can record them in the chat room area to the left side of your screen and we will leave some time towards the end of the discussion to answer those questions. And lastly, in order to receive the CE certificate for today, you will need to complete um, the presentation evaluation. It's a Google Doc that I'll be sending you at the end of the hour. And after you've completed that, we'll send you your CE certificate. Start with an introduction on agriculture, food production, and health. Thank you very much, Megan, I appreciate it. This is Barb Sattler and I am thrilled to start this new webinar, monthly webinar series. Um, just to kind of fill you in a little bit. Um, Megan, I, I can't forward, so you need to give me the conch so I can forward the slides. Or I can ask you to forward the slides. Uh, perhaps you'll have to ask me. Okay, next slide, please. Oops, one back. There, whoops. Okay, let me see if I can do it. Yes, it looks like I can do it now. Thanks. Okay, so as Megan said, we're going to be doing uh, a set of these. Right now we have seven lined up for you. And if there are issue areas that you're really interested in when we haven't covered them, we can continue on with this webinar series after that. What I'm going to be doing um, in the first half of this webinar is an overview. I'm going to be really just dipping my toe into areas that we'll be um, spending a lot more time on in the future webinars. And then we'll also, Megan will go and she's going to talk about soil seeds and pollinators, which are sort of the basics of agriculture uh, and some of the issues that are going on there. As you can see in this list of programs, we anticipate doing a bit of a deeper dive into farm workers and pesticides, food insecurity, climate change, and a variety of other things. All of our programs after we have completed them will be archived and within a few weeks will be, maybe two or three weeks, will be on the EnviroN website for not just you, but if you enjoyed this and think one of your one or more of your colleagues would enjoy it, you can send them there. So I am assuming that um, you are like most of us and you do eat three times a day, maybe not always looking as beautiful as this. But if you do, I think that among other things, we need to thank our farmers and our farm workers for that. 
as well as all of the workers in between there and, and our plates. And there's been just a lot going on in terms of modern farming and food production and food processing. And we're going to try and cover bits and pieces of that, always looking at it from a health lens and really always looking at it from the perspective of what can nursing do with this information. So a lot of people, when you think of farms, um, you think of something that has lots of green pastures involved, multiple species, you know, maybe some chickens and cows at the same time, a lot of different fruits and vegetables. But the truth of the matter is that most farming at this point in time, and what you should know is that most large scale farms in the United States are still at least 51% family owned. So we have large scale family farms and there's been a significant shift to what is called monocultures, whether it's with meat animals or chickens or fruits and vegetables, where on our farms, we're basically raising one particular crop or animal. And there's a certain degree of uh, economy of scale that happens with this, but also, as you will learn, there are, are also some downsides, both ecological and human health. This beautiful slide is actually in Northern California, and these are almond orchards. And this will just give you a sense of when we talk about monocultures, we talk about huge swaths of land where just a single crop, or in this instant tree, is planted. It's a big shift from how we used to do farming. And so when we do these monoculture farms, it, we really should think of them as an extractive industry. So we are pulling nutrients out of the soil. And so because we're doing this, we have a heavier reliance on external input. So we have to put things back into the soil, which include oftentimes synthetic fertilizers. And then we also often have to rely on pesticides because when you haven't created a nice balanced ecosystem, things get out of balance and you wind up with pests and things like mold and, and fungus as well as insects and other things. On our single crops, um, we also rely on tilling the soil or disking it. And then increasingly, we're De degrading the soil and we're uh, allowing for erosion. We know that we're depleting the nutrient base of our soil. And so what that means in the end is that we wind up with less nutritious foods. And this has been well documented that the food products that we're eating now, many of them are less nutritious. The same the same apples that we would have had years ago, the same tomatoes, et cetera. The other thing that happens with these monocultures um, is there's been a great, a, a substantial reliance on genetically modified um, organisms and, and seeds. And uh, Megan is gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. The other thing that we're doing with meat animals and chickens is we're raising them at, in places that they don't even call farms anymore. They call them concentrated animal feed organizations. 75% of our, our poultry is produced this way. And these, these chickens that you see here are being raised as um, for meat, essentially, or to be eaten. And what we do know is that we have continued to change the size and shape of chickens to appeal to the American palate, which is substantially about white meat and even more substantially about breast meat. And so you can see what the average chicken looked like in 1957 and where we've been heading over the decades to 2005. What we also know is that they've been uh, changing the ways that we raise chickens to, uh, to get to a point where they can come to maturity by 10 weeks old. So you can start with a little peep, a little chick up in the top left, and by 10 weeks, you can have a fryer completely mature and on your plate. So that has really shrunk in terms of the timing of how long uh, it takes. In addition to that, the way in which we do egg production 
is also in these concentrated animal feed organizations. Um, and these chickens often have um, no ability to roam. Um, they're in these cages and they are just fed and lay and fe feed and lay. Uh, a laying chicken will uh, start to lay eggs at about six months. At 12 months, they are uh, at peak. And then by 18 months, you start to have less than, um, often less than an egg. And especially when you've got uh, chickens that are stressed out, you get less eggs from them. In uh, certain parts of the country, and for instance, in Northern California, where we have a very big area where we have egg production being done, at 18 months, they actually sacrifice the animals and compost them. So these, these chickens are not even used for any kind of uh, uh, meat use, uh, not for dog food, not for anything. Um, they are merely composted and then returned to the soil. Um, in terms of hogs, about 55% of the world's hogs are now being raised on these concentrated animal feed organizations. Uh, very similarly, these are animals that are kept highly confined. They are not uh, allowed outside at any point during their development. And um, the, one of the additional problems that you have with hogs is that a hog will produce about seven pounds of solid waste a day. And, and that doesn't include their urine. And so what happens in these large CAFOs, as they call them, con confined or concentrated animal feed operations, is they then have to have holding ponds um, where the waste goes, um, both the solid waste and, and the liquid waste and sometimes combined solid and liquid. And in areas where this is happening, when you've got storms or flooding, and a lot of the Midwest is where these hog producing uh, areas are, this then just overflows into the communities and downstream and can be really um, very, very contaminating. In terms of dairy cows, um, Many of you may come some, from states where they graze dairy cows, and that is still fairly common around the country. But um, at the dairy farms, the small dairy farms, are really in trouble right now in the United States, and I, I want people to appreciate this. Um, in last year alone, we lost 2,700 family dairy farms. These were relatively small scale. If you're from Pennsylvania, um, they lost 370 dairy, dairy cows just last year. And you can see Wisconsin and Michigan, two other dairy states. Um, these small family owned dairy farms are having a very difficult time with making ends meet. Many of them have mortgaged their farm to the point where they can't mortgage it any longer and are going completely out of business. And in some instances, they don't have children who want to take over the dairy farms, but more often than not, it's because of the exigencies of their economic situation. What we are seeing though, is consolidation of the, of the dairies. And even though these may be family farms, they're getting much larger. So for instance, an average size of a dairy in Vermont would be 90 head of cows. The average size in the United Kingdom, 140. But if you look at the herd sizes, these are for um, just the counties in California, the Central Valleys in, Ca in California. And you'll see that there are many that are between 600 and 1,000 and several that are um, much greater than that. And in fact, just last week I met with a dairy farmer and he's got 2,500 head of dairy cows. Um, th that does, the size does not, in this instance, uh, necessarily mean that they're bad farmers. Sometimes this is the only way for them to actually sustain themselves economically. And I think we need to just really appreciate that. Um, about 15 to 20 percent of the cows in the United States are still being given uh, injections of recombinant bovine growth hormone. Uh, this increases the level of insulin-like growth factor um, that we see and can measure in the milk that they produce. But the reason they're given for this is it increases milk production. So it really, um, it, it stimulates the cow in terms of its metabolic processes 
and we see a, a greater amount of milk produced. But what we also know is that those cows that are getting uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone have a range of increased risks for uh, veterinary conditions, which include decreased fertility, an increase in, in their low birth weight babies or calves, uh, also increased mastitis and lesions on their teeth. And, and so they wind up then um, being ill and having to be culled from the, from the herd. Um, and it's this whole process of using this is banned in Canada and Western Europe, uh, Japan and Australia, and in the United States, as well as globally, it's condemned by the Humane Society because of all the risks that it creates for the cow. What is uh, also important for everybody to understand is unless you buy a certified organic milk product, you don't know whether that dairy used uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone on their cows or not, because there's no requirement for this to be labeled in either direction, either pro or con, <laughs> either it's there or it's not, neither of those things are on the label. So we really should be asking more uh, for information on our labels about this, or just banning its use, probably more importantly. Most cattle in this country, almost all of it are what's called finished, at feedlots, and that means in their last weeks, they are fattened up on these feedlots. Um, and that's, that's been a co common practice for dec well, actually centuries, that you fatten up the, the uh, beef at the end um, before you slaughter them. But we now have these feedlots that take over hundreds and hundreds of acres. And so they are so large now that they're creating both ecologic and, and human health threats. So there's a chemical and organic runoff that happens because of the amount of urine and manure that's created. And this then uh, creates excess nutrients that become part of the runoff that can get into the uh, nearby streams and creeks. And so what we see then are algal blooms and impaired uh, aquatic systems. Also, some of this, uh, some of the additional organic materials can leach into the groundwater or run off into the water that is used downstream for municipal and irrigation uses. Um, and it's no longer as sound as it would have been before. Um, we also know when we have these concentrated animal feed organizations, as well as when we have monocultures where we're doing a lot of tilling, and in some areas of the, of the country, we have both of these things happening um, side by side, that we see increased risks of cardiovascular disease, asthma, and chronic bronchitis. And this is a function of uh, increased particulate matter um, that is in the air from um, these variety of farm practices that are going on. And these are farm practices, once again, that are going on with these monocultures on large scale farming. Um, and you don't see the same kind of thing with smaller scale farming. I do want to touch on farm workers. Uh, we do not know exactly how many farm workers are in the country. Um, the estimate is 3 million. Um, we, the estimate once again is about 1.75 of them are undocumented. Um, at this point in time, they are mostly from Mexico and Central America. 39% uh, of them when surveyed nationally are men who are married but here without their family. Their average education is 18 years and their annual salary for doing this incredibly hard work um, is $13,800. We know that this not, is not just hard work, but also that um, accidents happen in and five times more, um, farm workers are five times more likely to die from an injury at work than all other workers in this country. They have, especially now with climate change, we're seeing extreme heat um, that, that even the farm workers hadn't experienced before. Um, and this has been going on now 
um, and can go on for weeks at a time in certain areas of the country. Um, they are much more susceptible to dehydration. Um, we also see them being exposed to a wide range of chemicals that are being used in the farms, uh, as well as crops that can be toxic when they are either touching them or in the presence of breathing them. And they also, in some farm areas, burn not just refuse, but burn the fields. So common ailments that we see include musculoskeletal respiratory problems, dermatitis, um, both acute as well as sort of chronic exposure poisoning to pesticides and heat illness. And layer on top of this, the fact that they have extremely poor access to health care um, pretty much wherever they are. And many of them, because they are not documented, will not seek care. Um, additionally, they have very seriously inadequate legal protections. Um, the agricultural sector is not required to pay the workers overtime, not required to provide workers' compensation in all but 12 states. Um, they do not follow the same child labor laws that the rest of the sectors do, and they don't pay for unemployment insurance in most states. So it sets them up for just a wildly um, uh, unjust situation from a legal perspective, health perspective, environmental per justice perspective, et cetera. Their living conditions, uh, Michigan, uh, one of the agencies in Michigan looked at all of the farm camps uh, that they had, the farm worker camps, and they found unhealthy housing, housing conditions in all of them. Um, and then you have the situation where many farm workers just are living in very informal settings, sometimes in cars, sometimes in, um, in trailers, um, and many times just terribly inadequate and unhygienic. A really important uh, point to note about farm workers, these are the folks that are putting the food on all of our plates and yet they suffer really terribly and much worse than most other Americans generally do in terms of food insecurity. So here are a range of uh, results of studies that were done. Um, in farm workers in North Carolina, California, Texas, and you can see the percentages um, significantly uh, uh, food insecure. Another issue which we'll be exploring uh, in some depth later on in our webinar series is food waste. The worldwide estimate is that we are wasting a third of the food that is produced is never gets to anybody's uh, digestive tract, and that 40% of all food produced in the United States is wasted. And we really must get a handle on this because from a climate change perspective alone, we are creating, we are using all kinds of inputs. We are transporting, we are uh, using all kinds of energy in order to produce something that then goes to waste. Uh, it just makes no sense at all. And, and still we have food insecurity in many communities. Um, so this is a really important one that we all are going to have to figure out how to address. And I think nurses can be uh, an inspired part of that solution. So what does USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, certified organic mean? Well, there are very specific things that it means. It means that if it is produce, fruits and vegetables, that it has been produced without pesticides, without the use of sewage sludge, which so, uh, for all, the, all other crops, we can use sewage sludge on our crops, on our, on our fields, often before we do the planting. Um, if it's USDA certified organic, there won't, they won't have used synthetic fertilizers or GMOs. They won't have any bioengineered crops, and they won't be using ionizing radiation uh, for food safety. So um, if it is a meat product, um, meat, poultry, eggs, or dairy, they, can't, um, they won't come from a non-cloned animal they won't have been given non-therapeutic antibiotics, and they won't have been given growth hormones. 
So what about these other titles or other labels that you see, natural, organic, pure, gluten-free? There's no accountability to these words. So there's no uh, regulatory body that is overseeing the use of these words. And so anything goes. The organic certification process, people often ask me about whether I trust, you know, something that says it's USDA organic. And um, this is the picture on the right is a picture of my farm. I actually have a farm and it's certified organic. And so I know the process. The process is that you have to submit an application. You have to say um, and submit an organic system plan, how it is that your farm has been managed over the last several years and how you plan on managing it um, in terms of how you're going to deal with pests. Um, and what use of uh, fertilizers you're going to have. That then gets reviewed by the certifiers. They come out and inspect your farm and they reinspect it annually. So while uh, there surely can be some people that may take advantage, I feel pretty comfortable that this process is a good one. The organic food production in the United States is a multi-billion process now. As you can see, the western part of the country has a lot more of the organic farms than um, elsewhere. Uh, and you can also see the list of how many billions of dollars it's creating for the state. So this is really a growing industry and our demand uh, as consumers is going to keep increasing the amount of food that's produced organically. One thing I should note quickly is you can monoculture organically. So you can still be um, working in a way that is not the best for the land, but better than monoculturing and giving using pesticides, etc. So this shows you what Mother Nature likes. Mother Nature likes lots of diversity. And if any of you are gardeners, you've probably seen a dandelion, and that is Mother Nature trying to be diverse in your garden. Um, you may not want to agree with that at that point in time, but Mother Nature really does want to see diversity, and that's because multiple plants and trees, are, well, trees are plants, multiple trees, bushes, ground plants, annuals, perennials, these feed upon each other, and they help to support each other and keep each other healthy. So what people are doing now is they're saying, well, we should just reproduce how Mother Nature takes care of soil and the earth. And so there are some new ways beyond just organic that are emerging here. Um, you may hear the word permaculture. Um, more, more recently, regenerative farming is the language that's being used, a way of really uh, stacking functions in, in the farm, having uh, true fruit trees and, and uh, nut trees at the same time as having vegetables and other things, um, and also bringing in grazing animals who are going to lay down manure um, that's going to regenerate um, some of the organisms and give them something to feed on that will then create healthy carbohydrates in the soil that then the plants can use. So this kind of agriculture is really the wave of the future and probably is going to save all of our lives. This is a simple definition. Um, regenerative agriculture is uh, farming and, and grazing practices uh, that, among other benefits, can reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon war draw down and improving the water cycle. So this will help rather than have water run off and down and out into the ocean, it helps to sink the water so that it restores and regenerates our aquifers as well as pulling carbon down, which at this point in time is critical in terms of climate change. So it's a way of improving our resources, our soil resources rather than depleting them. I just want to encourage you all to go on to what's on my food, not what's in my food, what's on my food. So do that, write that down and do that at your leisure and play around with that a little bit and share it with your friends and colleagues. I'd like us all to begin to think about what our vision as nurses 
would be for the future of food and agriculture, how we can create the conditions for equitable and affordable, sustainable, and even regenerative farm practices that are going to be healthy for everybody, everybody who works in the food um, production and everybody who's eating the food, that we really encourage farm to hospital practices and, and policies and uh, purchasing decisions, as well as farm to school. And we are going to be, um, we have created an, a, a food and agriculture committee for Annie. And I'm hoping that those of you who are on this call who are interested will uh, join us. Also, uh, Healthcare Without Harm, which is an, a national and international organization, has a healthy foods program, and they've got some great resources on their website that you can go to right now. We will be building out the resources on the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments website. Um, we really do hope that you on this call um, will be interested in joining. The, we'll probably have monthly calls for the Food and Agriculture Committee to figure out what it is that we as nurses can be doing. If you have some interest in that, my email is at the bottom of this slide, bsattler at usfca.edu. Please, in the subject line, just put food and agriculture or food and ag, um, and this way I'll know to include you in our listserv so you'll get information about our next call. And thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over back over to Megan. Thank you, Barbara. Um, bear with me as I load our second presentation. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about what we consider food and agriculture basics um, and the role of soil, seeds, and pollinators. So um, there are many ter terms to describe healthy agricultural practices, and Barbara touched on a few of those already. Permaculture, regenerative, organic, and I'm gonna add another one and that is um, polyculture. This photo is a beautiful photograph of Apricot Lane's farms in Ventura County. It's just north of Los Angeles. And um, it's this family purchased this property that had been farmed intensively for years and they transformed it into an example of regenerative farming. There's actually a movie out there right now called The Biggest Little Farm. And it's um, all about this beautiful story. Um, the picture to the right is a picture of monoculture, which um, Barbara already touched on. Um, that is a, is a process that um, developed after World War II in response to concerns over population growth, our ability to feed people. Uh, so unlike polyculture, which is, um, imitates biodiversity found in nature where several species animals are grown together. There's a mix of flowering plants with food crops. This is um, the repeated planting of a single crop over and over in one main large area. And it's primarily used to grow commodity crops actually. Um, so, and as a result, we have a surplus of these commodity crops that are being used mostly to support the processed food industry, um, feed animals and livestock, and for purposes other than food, um, about a third of our corn crop right now is being used for ethanol production. So these are unnatural growing conditions on the right. Um, and if left alone, nature would repopulate this with a diverse species of plants and you know, bring a lot more animals and insects back to the land. And it requires an enormous amount of fossil fuels to keep this system running. So we have five main commodity crops um, that receive government subsidies from the federal government. They are coin, corn, soybean, wheat, cotton, and rice. And 59% of all farmland in the United States is dedica dedicated to growing these crops in monoculture. So just to be um, just in contrast, less than only 2% of our land is being used to cultivate produce, fruits, and vegetables. 
There are some advantages to farming this way. Um, farmers can focus on a single crop adapted to a specific environment um, where they have the best access um, to a market to sell the product. Um, it's an economy of scale. You can maximize profits and um, minimize overhead. Labor is automated to machines instead of people. And was previously assumed to increase yield, but what we're learning is that poor soil health from repeated overuse and this lack of biodiversity, um, yield is no longer an advantage um, to monocrop farming. And the viability and profitability of this, these methods have grown along with the resources to support it such as having um, a lot of available credit, increased available availability to a variety of chemicals, seeds that have um, pest resistance built into them, GMOs, and the technology or machinery um, to do the work. Some of the disadvantages um, are, are that we're now understanding that soil fertility is critical to sustain quality food production. Chemicals, and the repeated tilling or disking of the weeds, um, a lot of times mainly just to have farms appear neat and tidy, uh, result in decimating the soil organisms, thereby depleting critical nutrients that are intended to enrich food crops. So you have a, you know, a loss of soil elements like carbon and nitrogen that then permeate into the atmosphere nearby rivers and streams, and, um, and it creates soil that is hardened, impacted. It reduces the ability of the soil to absorb water, and you have a lot of soil erosion and runoff. Um, and this is mostly, this type of erosion is mostly seen in commodity crops. So again, just a lot of labor, energy, and capital to maintain these systems. So the USDA Census of Agriculture in 2017 said that, reported that there were 2 million farms in the United States at that point, but they were, the number has been slowly declining since 2012, but the average size of the farm is increasing to adapt to this monoculture farming. Um, but as a result, you know, these rural communities are really suffering um, and profits are really going to a small handful of cor corporations and families who run farms remotely with driverless tractors and poorly paid staff. Um, where 37 cents used to go back to the farmer, they're now only getting about 15 cents back to the farmer. And supply, process, processing, distribution, and retail outlets are all controlled by these small few firms. So it's forcing farmers to survive on volume, creating a system where only the largest um, farms can may really make a living. So there are hundreds of thousands of lesser known and understood species working behind the scenes to create nutrient dense food for humans. On the right hand side of this slide, you'll see healthy soil and on the left hand side, you'll see depleted soil. Um, it is said that one gram of fertile soil can have 1 billion bacteria working in the business of soil respiration. Um, and it's the organic matter really in the soil that's critical to its health. And that includes bacteria, fungi, algae, archaea, protozoa, earthworms, nematodes, and even burrowing rodents. Um, all of these are needed for aeration of the soil. Um, and then the increased need for pesticides in monoculture um, wipes out all species of pets, pests and microorganisms, not just the ones threatening the crop or plants. And it really does interfere with the symbiotic nature of organisms to do the work of nutrient cycling. Um, consumers and decomposers are really the true players in nutrient cycling. Um, you know, uh, plants get their energy from photosynthesis. It pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, plants use carbon and water to create carbohydrates, which is stored as starch. And then the O2 is released as a byproduct. So the nutrients move through the food chains um, and then ultimately carbon is re-released into the atmosphere. Worms play a vital role. They eat plant material and organic matter. They excrete worm casings for other organisms to eat. They tunnel through the soil 
aerating it and creating areas for water filtration, increase absorption, and then they help obviously prevent runoff. Um, soil fungi absorb nutrients in water. Um, they decompose lignin, which is a component of cell walls. Um, and so the lack of biodiversity in the soil threatens the nutrient value of the food that is grown. Um, and so of course, in the absence of those nutrients, you need fertilizers to replace what was lost. We're starting to really understand the real connection between soil health and human health. Um, our gut microbiome is influenced by everything that goes into our body. And we are learning more that the gut microbiome plays a significant role in immune function. And it's interesting that many of the chronic and inflammatory diseases that we are seeing on the rise have risen in response to the environmental changes um, resulting from a lot of these chemical inputs in agriculture. And, you know, cancer is increasingly becoming um, likely for most of the population. And it's projected that one in two men and one in three women are now likely to receive a cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth looking at the environmental impacts um, of, of, and the effects of the gut, mi gut microbiome as it relates to food. And this article actually shows or, or uh, sort of shows a bit of a correlation between the environment that people live in and their gut microbial ecosystem. Um, and it seems that where people live, there is this correlation and that urbanization and distancing from the natural environment are contributing factors to reduced gut um, health and um, immune, immune function. So farmers are now exploring different mechanisms to improve soil health by sequestering more carbon in the soil than is being released through food production with the addition of organic standards to reduce chemical inputs. Um, this New York Times article from 2018 demonstrated uh, the journey of a couple here in Marin County in Nicasio who discovered that spreading compost across the land helped to increase carbon sequestration. It's now being called carbon farming, and it's a practice that slows um, the release of carbon back into the atmosphere by changing the flow of the sequence, not necessarily storing all of the carbon, but storing more than it is being released. And it's stored as occluded carbon versus labile car carbon. And occluded carbon is really an organic matter where the carbon is locked into root systems and other living organisms um, versus the labile carbon that's a constantly cycling. Um, through the atmosphere. So this can be achieved in a number of ways, um, by planting cover crops or reforesting, by using biochar, which is charcoal made from heated organic matter um, on the soil, um, wetlands restorations, agroforestry, no-till agriculture, and um, mainly keeping farmland covered with planting. Um, there's a large a majority of land in the United States right now that is being abandoned because farmers can't make a living, and bare dirt will bleed carbon into the atmosphere at a pretty um, significant rate. But the potential is there to remove billions of tons of, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through this type of um, carbon farming or regenerative practices, and it really does provide a brand new opportunity to care for the land um, in a better way that, that humans can reap the health benefits. Um, this slide just kind of represents a, um, a, a, describes just how much land could be used in this carbon farming practice. Um, and it's quite significant when we look at the amount of um, pasture land there is, um, where if we just adopted these regenerative practices, we could do a lot to, to uh, sequester carbon in the soil. Um, seeds are really the foundation of the food that sustains us. And until the last 20 years, seed breeding and archiving was controlled at the village, family, or farming community level. There is a deep cultural connection to seed breeding and saving of the past. And every crop of importance in the United States has survived and increased its yield as a result of skilled plant breeder techniques. 
um, and improved farming methods. So classical breeding is really a deliberate crossing of closely or distantly related species in the same species to produce desirable ef effects. Um, it's the process of combining parent plants to obtain the next generation of the plant with the best characteristics possible. So there's um, many terms used in seed breeding. Um, we want to be supporting are the organic heirlooms. Um, and there's this term called open pollination, and that's pollination that occurs naturally by birds, wind, humans, or other natural mechanisms. Um, and there's a lot of words on seed packages, um, heir heirloom, hybrid, organic. Um, heirloom seeds are those that are open pollinated and passed down from generation to generation. Um, seeds from heirloom vegetables are true to type, meaning you can save the seed from a certain plant and expect to get the same thing when you go ahead and plant those seeds the following season. Hybrid seeds um, is um, a process of hybridization, and it's a controlled method of pollination in which the pollen of two different species are, is crossed by human intervention. It's deliberately crossed to create a desired trait in the plant. Um, and, you know, hybrid vegetables are the ones that are typically being sold at the, at the local um, hardware store or grocery store. Um, and they're not always organic, so um, definitely want to watch for that. Um, and then organic seeds, mainly you're just looking for a seed that has been grown according to organic standards. And Barbara covered those in her last, um, in the last presentation. But through the advent of biotechnology and genetically modified organisms, there are fewer and fewer of the heirloom seed strains of crops left in the world. Um, genetically modified organisms or GMOs are bred through biotechnology from two different parent plants or species that would never cross pollinate in nature. And these are kind of some extreme depictions of what that would look like. Um, but they're, really it's the same companies that have a monopoly on agrochemicals that are slowly buying up all of the nation's seeds and genet genetically altering them with pesticides. So there's some arguments in favor of doing this from proponents of GMOs, obviously, um, that GMOs provide the best way to adapt to global changes, such as extreme weather, drought, et cetera. Um, GMO proponents claim to be able to keep that, by doing this breeding technology, biotechnology, that they'll be able to keep up with population growth and food production needs. Um, some say GMOs can be engineered to be more nutritious. Um, and that they would overall reduce pesticide requirements that would lead to increased biodiversity and soil health. Um, but as far as the potential health risks, proponents state that these crops are the most rigorously tested crops in history before hitting market. So obviously we know the arguments against are there really aren't real, very unknown human health effects. Um, these GMOs crops have not been around long enough for us to even determine a long-term health effect. Um, there's a high likelihood that um, it does, these GMOs increase allergy, allergies and also pass on antibiotic resistance. Um, but we do know that preliminary research on mice has shown structural and chemical abnormalities after um, being fed a diet of GMOs, and that's just over a relatively short period. Uh, so it's, it's not looking very good for humans. And it should be noted that, you know, there are plant-based, you know, healthy alternatives coming out um, that could also be GMO. Um, so it's not just in your processed food or, you know, junk food that you would find a GMO. Um, the um, Impossible Burger is a great example. It's made its way to every menu across the United States and Carl's Jr.'s and um, Burger King and whatnot. Um, and it actually is, it produces a red, red pigment, um, like as if it was um, a beef burger. 
so that you would be tricked into feeling that you're eating meat. Um, and so it's a yeast actually that's being um, genetically modified with soil leg soy legohemoglobin um, pr to produce that red pigment. So it's just important to be discerning when it comes that GMOs are really finding their way into a lot of different foods, not just what we would typically be considering um, junk food. There are four major firms now control the global seed stock, and um, they're, they were mergers from original six, but Bayer bought Monsanto, um, Dow and DuPont merged, and then Syngenta and ChemChina merged. And they own 60% of, of the global seed market. They own 75% of the agrochemicals that are used in intensive agriculture. And they create perverse patent laws um, once these companies have crossed a seed strain that prevents any farmer from doing his, his own breeding. And eventually this will trigger a reduction in biodiversity and food variety that does not contain a genetic modification. Um, so many of these chemicals we now know to be causing disease and they're being introduced into every area of our food system. But the intention is really um, to scale up industrialized agriculture and processed foods. Um, like I said, GMOs are, um, oops, sorry about that. GMOs are used primarily for in commodity crops um, and intended to wrap up, ramp up the production of those crops. Um, so 88% of the corn in the United States is now GMO corn, 93% of soybean. 90% of canola oil, and so on. So um, despite the confusing labels out there to increase marketing of non-GMO foods, there's really only one label that you can count on, and that's the organic label, um, because organic is inherently non-GMO. Um, organic means that no chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, all of that is being used. And so therefore it also means that chemicals are not being bred into the seeds. We've been seeing some, um, some positive results of greater awareness um, in the news. Uh, Costco became one of the first major retailers to um, pull Roundup, um, which has glyphosate, um, a common herbicide used in industrialized agriculture off the shelves. Um, because of this information that's coming um, to light about the damaging effect it has on humans and the natural environment. Um, there was an $80 million settlement awarded recently to a San Francisco man who sued Monsanto for, um, causing, for having caused his cancer. And then the most compelling story is a California jury just awarded a couple more than $2 billion against Monsanto which is a subsidiary of Bayer. And this is the third recent court decision involving claims that the company's Roundup weed killer is definitely causing cancer. So these are all positive examples of how the momentum is shifting um, to address these health concerns and, and stop business as usual in agriculture. Finally, I'm gonna cover pollinators. Um, the ecological service that pollinators provides benefits Two thirds of the world's crop varieties and the reproduction of 85% of flowering plants. Um, monoculture farming and industrialized agriculture has caused a severe loss of habitat for these organisms. Um, pesticide, pesticide use has indiscriminately killed off thousands of pollinators, and the loss of biodiversity um, has triggered an increase in viral and bacterial diseases in the insect population that never existed before. So obviously there's a huge array of wildlife that makes agriculture possible, including all of these pictures you see here. And bees are obviously in severe decline, but they're responsible for pollinating 90% of food crops. Um, it's one in three bites we eat. Um, the food originates from the pollination that bee bees provide and less than half of the bee population actually remains now from the levels just after World War II, which is also the time we started ramping up industrialized agriculture. Um, Syngenta and Bayer are the main producers of uh, 
a pesticide chemical called neonicotinides. And we, there's a lot of tie between neonicotinides and um, being uh, discovered in beehives. And so they're bringing it back to their hives and, and decimating lots of bees all at once. There's also been a mite infestation um, that is responsible for a lot of the bee decline. And recently, uh, wireless 5G technology um, is being uh, looked at because when bees are in the presence of that, they become really disoriented. So there could be multi-reasons, multi-factorial reasons for the decline, but definitely neonicotinides are, are largely responsible. And when bees are exposed to neonicotinides at 25 parts per million, which is a common level used in farm fields, they suffer, they suffer neurologic disturbance and death. It also should be noted that if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's to buy your plants, they used to have signs saying they were neonicotinide free. Um, with a lot of the information that's emerging over the destruction of the bee pollination from this persistent chemical, they sort of stopped labeling them. But that doesn't mean they're not actually using that the plant you're buying doesn't have, hasn't been treated with neonicotinides. So we, we just can need to continue to be discerning consumers and um, you know, know where you're buying your plants and, and, and their practices. So there are some things we can do to combat the decline of pollinators. Uh, one is use pollinator-friendly plant and farm and personal gardens. You want to choose a mixture of plants for each planting season and ideally reduce or eliminate pesticide use altogether. And then we also need to accept there's going to be some damage on our food. Ugly food is just as nutrient dense uh, as perfect looking food. And um, we can also help to reduce food waste at the source by changing our expectations of how food looks on at the market or on the shelf. Um, we do want to provide a source of clean water for pollinators next to farms and gardens. And we don't want to clear out all the debris on our properties and, and, and homes. We, some dead tree trunks are really good for beetles and other bugs to proliferate. So clearing the land is not always the the best for um, So lastly, biodiversity is really the key to ecological and human survival. Biodiverse soil critical is critical to, to maintaining nutrient density in the food, um, the types of crops that are available, and also the microorganisms that are working on behalf of human health. We want each species to be able to function to support one another, and that is the, the whole goal of biodiverse planting and farming. And it builds resiliency to threats of extreme weather, climate changes, or environmental disasters, and also creates lasting beauty in the environment. So today I discuss soil seeds and pollinators, and I'm going to end with a quote by Dr. Zach Bush, who is a leader in the regenerative farming um, movement and has a lot of great information about how soil microbiology is tied to human, the human microbiome. And I encourage you to look him up. Um, but his quote is, we created this era of chemical mega farms that has led to the destruction of our soils, water systems, oceans, and human health. But by the same reality, we can transform this planet to the most verdant and regenerative ecosystem that has been in many millennia. So we thank you for joining us today. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'll look at those now. Barbara, I have you see you muted. Can you unmute yourself? Um, one of the questions, I guess, is Barbara's email. I'll provide that in the email. Uh, the other thing is in terms of organic food inspections, do these vary by state and in terms of availability and inspectors? And um, just have to figure out why Barbara is muted to answer that question. And 
And if we can't figure that out, I'd be happy to get that question answered um, for you. Uh, it looks like she didn't mute herself and I'm having a hard time unmuting her. So, um, but okay. I, if those- Okay, can there. you hear me? Okay, good, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, what, can you just tell me what the question was again? I was typing. Uh huh. It says, um, in terms of organic food inspections, do these vary by state in terms of availability and inspectors? Oh, yeah. And ask that question. So um, I, I, I can't with any authority say that, but I know that each one of the state agencies is accountable to the USDA. So in the same way that you have state agencies that are agencies of environmental protection that are taking care of air pollution and water pollution in your state, these same state agencies are given that accountability to the USDA. So I, I would be loath to guarantee anything, but I do feel comfortable saying that those state agencies are mostly really good folks trying to do a good job. Okay, and it looks like the other question is, um, what's on my food? What's on my food website? Does this site speak to geographic differences in terms of pesticide use? And that's from Anne. Um, no, what this what this number what the numbers represent on what's on my food are the residues that have been found on foods that have been collected by the USDA. So I don't know whether they have taken foods from all over the country. So for instance, if they're looking at apples, there are a lot of different kinds of apples from a lot of different places in the country. And so they may just average them at this point. And I think it's a really good question and we will try and find out about their methodology and talk about it in one of our future conference calls. Um, and I think it was Anne who asked that question, I'll try and get back to her directly too. Right, and then the last question, um, if you don't see it on the chat feed here, you want, wanted to repeat Barbara's email address and that's bsattler at usfca.edu. So b-s-a-t-t-e-r at usfca.edu. And if you are going to be uh, emailing me and want to be placed on the listserv for the new Food and Ag Committee of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, then please put in the subject heading Food and Ag so that I can keep them all in one place. Appreciate that. Okay, and there's a couple more questions here. I'll invite anyone to stay who wants to stay. We'll, we'll answer them and go over um, anyone who needs to leave by all means. And we hope to see you at the next webinar um, on July 1st, I believe. Um, so the next question is, are there initiatives to build heirloom seed banks? Um, this is a very, very, very important question. Um, many communities have had heirloom seed banks over the years. There are um, organizations, local granges, G-R-A-N-G-E-S, granges, that um, uh, sometimes have seed savings and seed, seed exchanges. There are other places like libraries, literally book libraries, that sometimes have seed saving. At my university, the University of San Francisco, our campus library does seed saving. So you'll find seed, sa seed saving in a variety of places, but why this is an important question is that the industry that Megan talked about, which are these four now mega, mega companies that are controlling seeds, are trying to make it illegal to do food ex uh, seed exchanges. This is really important for us to be keeping track of um, and also opposing when we see this happening at a state level. And it's my understanding is they're trying to promote this starting at state levels so that they can kind of do it a little bit under the radar screen. We should be absolutely against anybody who's trying to um, squash seat saving and seat exchanges. Um, that's really, really important. 
Right. And the last question I'm seeing here is that um, Trisha said she's very curious about the 5G networks and bees um, and if there's somewhere more where she can learn more about pollinators. Um, and there's plenty of organizations out there that have great information. I'm not sure specific to the 5G network, but perhaps Barbara can speak to that. Um, yeah. So the, the main organization that has great information is called the Pollinator Partnership. Um, they have a national office in, uh, in San Francisco, California, but I think they also have some offices in Washington, D.C., but they've got a great website. And um, actually, in terms of Wi-Fi and uh, cellular towers, you can just do a, a Google Scholar search and you'll, you're going to start to see um, some studies on these issues. That's how I've begun to um, collect some of the science there. Uh, this is really, you know, more for entomologists than for nurses, but I think that we should be aware of what's going on. And I know that one of the folks, uh, Catherine Dodd, who's on the call right now, um, is really looking at some of the literature having to do with 5G technologies and um, and what we're learning in terms of human health risks. So, so another whole area that nurses are starting to look at as well. Okay, so if there are no further questions, it looks like there's none, none listed here in the chat room. Um, we will conclude this webinar for today. Um, I will be sending you a, like I said, and um, Dorothy just said, will this webinar be available on the Annie website? And yes, it will. We're going to put it there with a link um, for you to review later. Uh, we may need a, a week or so to get that up and running, but we'll yeah, be there soon. I would give us a couple of weeks, but, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. I'm just so pleased that so many of you are interested and we hope to stay in touch with you. Yeah. Our next one will be on the topic of pesticides. Okay. Thank you very much. And I look forward to um, seeing you in the, in the follow-up webinars. Take care. Bye, Bye now, everybody.